so I speak to you today as uh, one of a very tiny minority of CTBUH speakers. Uh, that is, I'm a historian. What I'll discuss, I hope, is a good uh, history of a current phenomenon. That is, I'm going to talk about New York's super slender, ultra luxury towers. All buildings are a product of time and place. This paper describes this group of super slender, ultra luxury residential towers currently on, on the rise in Manhattan. Um, let me go here. All, all 50 to 90 stories, which represent an entirely new type in the, in the, in a, of skyscraper in a city where improbably slender towers have a long history. More than a dozen such remarkable buildings are now underway, and there will most certainly be more. You see a dozen here. These celebrity spires are headline grabbers, not only uh, for their architect designers, but even more for their stratospheric condo prices. The only tower that is next. Um, the only tower that is currently topped out and fully enclosed, which is named 157, and designed by Pritzker winner Christian de Portsam Park, has sold two penthouses for $90 million US. Uh, other reported sales range from about $30 million to $60 million. While some owners will enjoy their Aries as a primary residence, many apartments are being purchased simply as investments by wealthy individuals, LLPs, and by international buyers. Indeed, they are, uh, as in the words of one uh, well-noted real estate appraiser, strong boxes in the sky. Last year, the Skyscraper Museum mounted an exhibition called Sky High and the Logic of Luxury, which surveyed this group of designs and analyzed the conditions that created them. This paper summarizes that longer effort, which is archived in full on the museum's website, uh, which is skyscraper.org, and it's also, it also endeavors to explain this phenomenon in the context of the Manhattan real estate market as it has continued to evolve uh, in, uh, in this last year. As you see, the design approach is not stylistic. The facade treatment can be a complete glass membrane or masonry curtain wall with punched windows. The structural system uh, can be internal shear walls or mega columns or an exterior bearing wall. Some of these towers are exceptionally tall. Indeed, the loftiest one to be built by the same developer as 157 will rise to about 1,490 feet, 454 meters making it the tallest rooftop in the city. But it's not height that characterizes this type, it's slenderness. Slenderness is the key design development strategy of these towers, which range uh, in height from about 600 feet, 200 meters, to around 1,500 feet. Slenderness keeps the floor plate small, as tiny as 3,000 square feet, um, I'll say 270 square meters. Uh, I'll, I'll probably slip into my English uh, um, numbers uh, more, more often. Uh, and, but uh, in any case, in order to create the, these small floor plates, create the exclusivity of one or two apartments per floor. Slenderness also reduces the number of elevators that are required. Indeed, some of these towers of 50 to 80 stories have only five elevators two pairs of passenger and one uh, service elevator. This further narrows the core. Slenderness lifts the project's maximum uh, FAR, floor area ratio, which I'll explain in a moment, as high in the sky as possible to achieve commanding views. These buildings are essentially periscopes. True slenderness, a thinness that requires special, en special engineering considerations, generally begins at a ratio of a base to height of about 1 to 10 or 1 to 12. Such towers require expensive uh, measures to mitigate the exaggerated forces of wind, including additional material and structure to stiffen the building and dampers to counteract sway. To visualize this 1 to 12 ratio, I put an English ru ruler over here on the left. Uh, and uh, on its end, it's, of course, a 1-inch ruler, a ratio of 1 to 12. So this graphic compares the original One World Trade Center uh, and 432 Park Avenue, one of the new slender towers over on the right. One World Trade Center has a slenderness ratio of, of 1 to 7. 
uh, uh, as you can see, it's very tall, but it's not very slender. 432 Park has a slenderness ratio of 1 to 15. The white grid of 432 Park Avenue, designed by Raphael Vignoli, has a square shaft of just 90, uh, 93 feet, about 30 meters, on each side, and it rises to the, uh, 426 meters. Um, its rooftop will thus be the higher than either the original World Trade Center or the new one World Trade Center. The skinniest building now under construction in New York um, or in the world is 111 West 57th Street, designed by Shop Architects. It stands on a base about 60 feet wide and it'll rise to more than 1,350 feet, which is an unprecedented ratio of 1 to 23. The structure was designed by WSP Group, um, which is the same engineering firm responsible for the majority of the super slender towers now in development. So unlike the, the title of world's tallest, the title of world's most slender is a category that's never had very much competition. The current holder, record holder is the 72-story apartment tower in Hong Kong known as High Cliff, which has a slenderness ratio of 1 to 20. Completed in 2003, High Cliff was a prototype with no followers. Even in high-priced Hong Kong, where regiments of 50-story pencil towers comprise housing estates and luxury apartments uh, commonly reach 80 stories, the slenderness of High, of high Cliff was not repeated. Uh, the other place, of course, uh, is Dubai. Uh, and here you see Dubai Marina. Uh, where the point towers uh, proliferate you know, here in Dubai Marina, but where, as you can see from this floor plan of the Princess Tower, which is just a little bit shorter than 432 Park Avenue, um, uh, eight or ten apartments per floor are the normal marketing strategy of these towers. By contrast, 432 Park has one or two units per floor, and you're seeing the high-end luxury of the penthouse suite, which is about a eight, that little more than 8,000 square foot uh, penthouse. Now, I'm not going to talk about the engineering challenges and the um, innovative technologies that make these buildings possible, and we've certainly talked a lot in this conference about tuned mass dampers and slenderness ratios in other sorts of buildings. So I'll, I'll skip by that, and these buildings would not have been possible without sophisticated engineering. Um, but despite this central importance that, uh, that enables these towers, it's not sophisticated engineering that makes, uh, makes them possible, but rather it's a platform of price, a per square foot cost, um, that needed to be established for these buildings to make sense. The sale prices that ignited this, the recent proliferation of super slender residential condos existed in Manhattan only since 2004. In particular, two buildings on the southwest corner of Central Park um, uh, demonstrated this new price platform for condo sales. They're the glassy twin towers of the Time Warner Center and the masonry mansion of 15 Central Park West. Neither building is technically slender. The Time Warner Center, which was completed in 2004, uh, has one residential tower, and the first condo sold in 2001, before it was finished, for record prices of about $30 million, averaging $3,000 per square foot. In 2008, the year of its completion, 15 Central Park West recorded a penthouse sale price of $45 million for an average sale price, of, average price of $6,400 per square foot. This same unit famously sold for $88 million in 2012, um, which was the highest price ever in the city at the time. Uh, and it was sold to the co-ed daughter of a Russian billionaire, which got everybody very ex um, exercised. Uh, these buildings raised the expectations of developers and gave confidence to their lenders that high-priced towers with commanding views of Central Park could reap sky-high prices. This map of the blocks of, um, that border Central Park shows the footprints in red of the new super slender towers that were planned or had permits last October. Uh, the, this image uh, by Armand Boudreau for Yimby, for, for whom we thank for this compilation, 
uh, shows um, three, uh, well, three more towers that, are all, that have also recently, more recently been announced. The shortest of the group will be 51 stories and the tallest uh, 92 stories and to its rooftop 1,490 feet or 454 meters. Uh, this very recent uh, digital compilation uh, um, shows, shows them all together in one scheme. So why are they all located in this area? To restate the obvious, it's the view. Whether on Park Avenue or mid-block on 53rd Street, the raison d'etre of these super slender towers is to maximize the number of units with commanding views of Central Park. When a building is 100% residential, the no, the, um, no view lower floors are devoted to amenities such as gym, spa, pool, screening room, meeting spaces, nanny apartments, wine cellars, uh, and back of house operations. At 432 Park Avenue, the first condo starts above the 30th floor. Um, and those are the views from uh, 432 Park, designed by Rafael Vignoli. Several projects, including 157, try again, uh, and the one by the same developer, uh, Extel, are mixed-use projects with hotels in the base and the lower floors. Uh, the Tour Vert, designed by Jean Nouvel, uses the first three floor stories of the, the tower as galleries for the Museum of Modern Art. It has a hotel in the middle zone and condos above. The towers are essentially periscopes that raise the living rooms up high in the sky in order to capture these um, park panoramas and, and city views. For these luxury lifestyles, um, condo buyers have committed to sales that report an average of $3,000 to $6,000 $6, a square foot and higher. And for our exhibition, and you can see this on our website, uh, Andel Hilton put together our, the research that we did on condo prices and the first sales that um, is enormously interesting to look at in detail, and you can blow it up there and read every, um, every digit. But what you notice in the year 2000 in that graph, which about halfway through is the year 2000, the condo prices have doubled in New York from 2000 to 2013, and that includes the worldwide recession of 2009, 10, and 11. So as I said, while these buildings couldn't be built without the innovative engineering that enables their great height, it's the, the, their, um, their raison d'etre in the history of the skyscraper really belongs to the, base, to the fundamentals of the high-rise building and New York's characteristic improbably slender towers. This is the little Gillinder building of 1897 on the corner of Wall Street and Nassau, 23 feet by 73 feet and 18 stories tall. It exemplifies the basic principle of high-rise design that high demand for location produces high rents, produces high-rise buildings. And so this brief, uh, walk through the history of New York shows you speculative towers well placed here uh, with the address of one Wall Street uh, and the impulse to multiply the value of the land when there is no municipal constraint uh, over, uh, over building height in, uh, in office buildings and a showroom that uh, advanced through Midtown by the 19 teens. Uh, after 1916, a new zoning or a, a zoning law was imposed that uh, that created the characteristic step back in New York, but it allowed a tower to unlimited height over a quarter of the site. So New York still didn't have a cap on the buildable envelope uh, of building, uh, and you see these characteristics. Uh, slender towers emerging from the setback base in the hotels that uh, line Central Park at, uh, at 57th Street. They are commercial buildings, and uh, residential buildings did have a cap, but, re but the residential buildings that imitate those luxury hotels um, that begin in the 1980s, uh, and here you see in a Trump Tower on the left of the 1990s and of a Zeckendorf project on, on the right, of the early 2000s take the language of these 1920s towers in a postmodern uh, style, but they're built within what is the all-important new zoning law restrictions in New York after 1916, which establishes a, a, a limit on the buildable space. And this 
characteristic FAR, or floor area ratio, maximum amount of, of buildable space on a New York lot, is um, the, uh, the principle that constrains uh, high-rise buildings in New York and produces these very slender towers um, via the logic of luxury, which I'll now continue to illustrate. Uh, this is the zoning lot uh, diagram and application for the Department of Buildings for 432 Park. Uh, by taking the maximum amount of buildable space that's allowed on, on a lot, uh, and changing the configuration, as you're allowed to do under the law. Uh, the tower pulls back and occupies only a portion of the site, as you can see here. Uh, and uh, in the model that we showed in the exhibition, uh, pulls back from the street, opens a plaza, creates their mechanical fl uh, floors above a commercial space, uh, and has a small park space uh, devoted to the public. So the, the buildable FAR, that you can see uh, how we modeled here in the exhibition, contrasted it against the photograph in the back of the unlimited uh, portion of the envelope that was allowed by the 1916 law, but constrained by the 1961 law, you can see in this model. And if you take all of the little pieces of buildings of the Drake Hotel that's down below the tower, and all of the brightly colored, unused, air right space that were, that were bought up by the tower uh, and then placed at the top, as you can see them re-indicated at the top, you have um, the system of, air right, of uh, maximum FAR and purchasable air rights that create the logic uh, for the building form of, the su of these super slender towers. So to... to um, to summarize that, the 1961 law created two provisions that set the rules of the real estate game in New York. First, it'll, it, uh, first in order to allow the system to function, it established an as-of-right, which allows property owners to design and build whatever they wish without a public review process, so long as they follow the rules for their lots. And second, owners uh, can sell their underdeveloped uh, rights, the floor area, or FAR, as air rights to developers of a contiguous lot by a mechanism known as tra transferable development rights, or TDRs. When the underbuilt area of a lot is sold and it's used on an adjacent site, the low-rise space will remain low forever. So FAR is finite. It's a cap and it's, it can only be used once, and it's a cap-and-trade system in the overall built um, environment of New York. So all of these super slender towers now in development use the mechanism of purchased air rights in order to create their additional stories. Often they change um, the footprint, as you saw. Uh, well, here's one that, that uh, um, failed, with purchased air rights, but uh, because it w did go through uh, a public review process uh, before the City Planning Commission, actually, um, as they say, got a haircut. Um, 200 feet was uh, subjectively removed or prohibited from the design. Uh, so that that plan for the tower uh, was, uh, for 1,250 feet was actually cut down to 1,050 feet. And this is the Jean Nouvel uh, tower that's, uh, that's above the Museum of Modern Art. So the, um, the as-of-right uh, development can be seen in part here with the this, this, um, skinniest of all, the 111 West 57th Street Tower, uh, which did have to go through a portion of a public review, which was a landmark review because it was uh, adjacent or it used part of a, a landmark property. But as you can uh, see here uh, in the drawings that were submitted in order to convince the Landmark Commission that this tower should set back into the middle of the block, uh, you can see in these other drawings how the, the zoning law and the sky plane forces the, the setback at the, at the upper stories. So it's really the constraints of New York's municipal laws that shapes these towers. Um, but to the extent that all developers will want to, to exempt themselves from any kind of subjective review, all of the towers that you see um, imaged here, or imagined here, uh, as, as built out in the future, represent as-of-right construction. 
So just very quickly to look into the towers, um, 432 Park uh, in the grid uh, that you see here rises high above its surroundings. Uh, you can see how this is a, a view of about 10 days ago uh, on a cloudy day, but you can see how its uh, slenderness com contrasts with the commercial buildings of typical office floors. Uh, the tower in its square proportions uh, all overall with its windows and every aspect of it with this, the square as its uh, model and its module is, uh, still has about another uh, quarter of height or so to go. Uh, and you can see Raphael Vignoli presenting the tower here at a, a, a lecture that he gave for us uh, and discussing in terms of the plan but also the compact core uh, the configuration of the few elevators that service the 96-story height of the building. As you can see here, once you get above the 30-story 30, 30 um, base of the building, in, in effect, the elevators uh, in, that service the top floor drop away. So in fact, you only have two elevators, two passenger elevators, um, servicing the stories between 68 and 96. Uh, and you can see in the plan where we, where, where we colorized in gray, the service stairs and the service elevator, um, that's, that space is, uh, is extremely important in determining the height of the building um, and also the, the logic of luxury. Because as you can see in the detail from the section, uh, the floor to floor, the slab to slab, or floor to floor height um, of, the, of this tower and of almost all of the towers that have followed it is 15 and a half feet, so five meter uh, floor to floor slab. Um, really unknown uh, in New York building and especially in, in um, residential building. But this floor to floor slab is determined by the switchback scissor staircase that shares a landing, and a landing that's determined by code, um, in New York code. So that in, uh, when it becomes possible in order to make this, the scissor stairs um, very compact, 10% uh, of the space of the staircase is saved by the developer, and that that space is sold as living space to the condo purchaser. And at $6,000 a square foot, this represents a considerable amount of money. So by creating a more luxurious space, but selling it at a high price, the logic of luxury dictates that it makes more sense to have a 15 and a half foot ceiling than a 12 and a half foot ceiling. Uh, the, for the same developer that did the skinny tower I showed you before, the Zeckendorf's an even taller one um, that, that exploits the same principle of stretching um, the floor heights up in order to raise your eyeballs higher into the sky in order to get um, the view of the park. Uh, and uh, this one is by Robert Stern, uh, who's, uh, who also designed this tower, uh, which is a combination of the Four Seasons Hotel and condominiums above that you see in stone in the center. It rises above the world's tallest building in 1913, the Woolworth Building that you see just to its left. And as you can see, it's downtown adjacent to the World Trade Center redevelopment. Uh, a detail of it there with its, uh, um, its manufactured stone facades. Uh, and uh, learning from the experience of 432 Park, Vignoli has a, a project that is just to the south of, of the World Trade Center development that in this recent redesign, after the site was sold by the first developer to, uh, to the second, grew about 25% taller. And how did it get taller? It didn't have any more FAR. It raised its ceiling heights in order to get higher. So the same architect designed for another developer uh, a building which has on the same footprint, but which is taller than the one that he designed before. And this one is condos, not rental. Uh, Herzog and Demuron, my time is running out, but it's just to show you a, a series of these views and the idea of exclusivity, which allows you to walk out of, the, of your own private elevator into your own um, open apartment with a panoramic view that is the wow factor that the um, developers sell to their clients. Herzog and Demuron with their villas in the sky with a series of stacked towers with these um, very bold cantilevers that look like this on the lower floors as they're just being glazed last week in New York and the tower is about two-thirds of its height as you can see here. Uh, Helmut Jan in a project that was designed in 2007, um, so not quite as slender. Uh, if he had done it today, it might have been different. 
and I know my time's up, the other uh, towers that uh, uh, preceded this last group. So uh, one Madison where Rupert Murdoch has just bought the top three floors of this for his own private residence, uh, and um, on the same block in New York, the, this KPF project. On the west side, in uh, another uh, westward extension of, in Hudson Yards, two, two residential towers, but most particularly the one by Diller Scafidio that you see with its corseted, uh, it's called the corset, um, cinching at the waist, which unfortunately I think has recently been valued engineered. So um, here they are, these last towers. Once again, uh, the developers of the current super slender ultra luxury towers endeavor to use the expensive F FAR of both their original lots and the purchased air rights to rearrange their floor area as high in the sky as possible. Their costly approach gives rise to the term logic of luxury. Spending more on design and creating exclusivity can reap enormous profits. So I hope that you can see how this um, historical development in relationship to the zoning law, the constraints of New York, grow a vernacular type that represents the present in New York as, as well as its history. So when you come to New York next year to the Council's uh, conference, I hope that I've whetted your appetite to see some of these new wonders of New York. Thank you. Thank you.